Ya. There's too much light in here, it works very well. But there isn't so much light. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> thanks for coming out tonight. Tonight's the Hot Pot Lab Part 2, and um, if there's any real Asians here, you know what a hot pot is. It's when you throw up in a bunch of um, different ingredients and you get a nice broth at the end. So the idea of this event is the same thing. We're throwing in all these different elements in, and we're kind of sharing and uh, talking about it. And um, it was great to have the second edition with uh, Peter over there, who's the... Um, He's the writer of a very popular blog, Create Digital Music and Create Digital Motion. He's also the founder of Handmade Music, which is a series of events that's been going around around the world. And uh, it was kind of a perfect ma match for us to link up. So tonight's uh, game plan is um, <laughs> we're going to start with Peter um, giving a short presentation about sort of the DIY culture that he advocates very strongly and then maybe have a little bit of dialogue with myself. And then we're going to have a guided tour of each project. Each person will have about five to ten minutes to talk about their thing. After that, we're going to have a piece by Hans Koch, who's a resident here right now at Stein. He's working on a piece um, that's going to be shown next week at the Sonic Axe Festival. But he's going to show his piece called uh, More and More, which is an ensemble piece for computers. And it's a beautiful piece. So we'll do that, and then we'll have another free session. So if you guys get interested in listening to people talk, just go up to the people and ask them stuff. So um, I'm going to pass it on to Peter. I don't know if you guys want to just sit on the ground or just hang around. But Nothing's happening over here except for me. So make yourself comfortable. It's sort of everywhere around our international community. You know, whenever you do it, the great thing about doing an in-person event is that you get um, everybody in the same room who might otherwise only connect virtually. But it's, it's um, it, there is more than you can see. We hatched back in New York. It was just happening in Brooklyn. But then because it was online, other people started doing it. So what be began as Handmade Music Brooklyn has now become Handmade Music Berlin, uh, Porto, Portugal, Austin, Texas, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and other places. And without, actually, any intervention from me, just sort of the idea that uh, I and an uh, online site called Etsy and uh, Make Magazine, we sort of put this idea out there and people just kind of picked it up. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about Kind of where what the state of the DIY? There are slides behind you now, so. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the state of the uh, the DIY movement in in music making. So just like our president has the State of the Union address, this was in my mind sort of the state of DIY address or thoughts, um, and uh, it. it 
while we were talking about this event, Taku and I went back and forth with some discussion about what this stuff means. And I, on reflection, what it means to me, I think I'm really biased by my experiences as a composer. You know, and as a composer, it, music is about more than just the physical expression you make with your hands. You're always dealing with you come up with an idea, a musical conception, and then you have to make that conception abstract and give it to someone else. And for centuries and centuries, the way of doing that has been standardized music notation, evolved from things that looked more like this. And I've had the fortune, misfortune of spending a lot of time learning how to sing from this kind of notation. Um, but you know, the, the birth of notation was, was all about standardizing musical practice, standardizing what people were doing. It came out of the church wanting to uh, uh, get rid of some of the local variations that were happening in different places, some of which I'm sure, in fairness to that church, probably sounded odd or awful in some cases, but, you know, this, this was a way of standardizing what people were doing. And now, uh, all these centuries later, it's so embedded in the way we think about music that it does turn up in other places. So if you look closely at the game Rock Band, or you just turn your head 90 degrees to the side, you'll see what the interface in the game Rock Band actually is, is, a, is musical staffs. In fact, when they added instruments, if you turn, it, turn your head 90 degrees, they even added them like the staves would appear on the score. And they even introduce new problems because they use these colored rectangles and there are no flags on the musical notes to tell you what length the rhythms are. They have to do something pretty elaborate with watching those things come towards you and trying to guess when they're going to hit, uh, hit the line. So in a way, it's harder to read the notation in rock band than it is to read standard music notation. Mm -hmm. But you'll, they even went to, there are even five spaces. So there's even little uh, remnants of the five-line staff. And of course, you know, over the last century, a lot of composers were experimenting with ideas of how to break out of that score and come up with things that look different. But we still had this problem of then you hand it to a musician, and you have to figure out what the heck to do with that. If you had, if it had no instructions, I don't know, you might try to play the notes and turn in a circle really fast, or... Uh, pour water on yourself. I don't know what you would do to, you know, without without a lot of instructions. What's happened with computers is now instead of notation being a translation from your idea to something else, and then a musician has to translate that back to music. Now those visual representations and abstractions can be whatever you want, and they can have an immediate result, and you can interact with them directly. So. As, as a composer who was always interested in how do you create pictures of your musical thoughts, we live in a really exciting time. But it means that you have to, 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 to do this, you have to become makers. You have to become developers and inventors to really engage in, in everything that you could possibly do. So this is an iPhone game called Elis, and it, the, the graphics that you see are associated with the sounds. But I, I, not only do these graphics represent what, what this game designer's musical ideas were, I think when you look at hardware design, deciding what each knob does, deciding how, how they're placed, these are also kinds of interactive compositions that have graphical interfaces for people to use. And so they are reflections, they're objects, and they're objects you can use, but they're also reflections of this person's way of thinking. And um, this is a Mo 960 sequencing module. This is part of what, what began all of this new uh, computer technology with new ways of arranging musical events that didn't rely on the score. Um, it, just like a, a score, you still read it from left to right. So a light will march from the left side to the right side, just like written language in Western culture and just like music notation. But the, suddenly we had the ability to directly change what the musical output was. And then the, the next in this line, uh, this is the Fairlight CMI 
um, music sequencer. A lot of the grids in music that we have today owe their creation to this um, to this product. Um, so it, it looks kind of like a musical score, but if you look at it, it this is actually a, a grid of musical events. So uh, these early technologies are, are deeply embedded in the new DIY creations and new independent designs. <coughs> you may have seen some of these things around. If you haven't yet, you probably will. It's called the Mono. This is an, an open source clone of that instrument called the Arduino, um, which is was invented because people couldn't get enough monos, and so this is a way of building your own over, out of more readily available parts. But that grid that starts on the mode in the analog age starts on the Fairlight in the digital age. The grid of musical events has now become both software and hardware. It's both the idea and the object. And um, the, we've gone from music notation that has very, very specific ideas about how to fit rhythm and everything together to the digital age where the canvas is wide open. This grid is, has, there's nothing differentiated on this grid. You could overlay any system on top of it that you want. And people can understand it immediately because they can interact with it directly, as, as if interacting directly with the composer's brain and not with a the, with the piece of paper. Um, but it's, you know, we also find Lots of other ideas about how to sequence events. Um, this is a, a optical circular sequencer. Um, and uh, uh, this is a project called SubCycle, which uses 3D graphics as a way of manipulating some of the sound. So you know, lots and lots of ideas out there. So this is kind of my, uh, this is kind of how I feel about the traditional music industry event, uh, NAM. Um, this is where, you know, as a, as a music tech writer, this used to be where we got our direction for what was important. And this is where most of the consumers got their idea of what was important, was at this big trade show, NAM. And I'm not, not to knock NAM. I went there last month. There were no, uh, I didn't see any Playboy bunnies, but they may have been there in the guitar section. But uh, not to knock that event, but what I found in the five years now that I've been doing the site is not only did I, not only was I interested in what people were inventing themselves, and not just what the big music manufacturers were inventing, but the musicians and readers were more interested in stuff like the stuff that is, that's in this room, things that were weird and anomalous and and one of a kind and and different, and not just you know hardcore academic music geeks and doctoral students like myself, but also uh, the average mu musicians and DJs and people really cared about the stuff that was happening. So that brings me to the next half of my thought, which is what, uh, what this DIY stuff is about and what kind of state it's in. So I think what can be intimidating about a lot of this stuff is it's very complicated, it's very technically sophisticated, um, it takes a whole lot of time to, to build the technology, and musicians may not have the time to create their own things. Um, but a lot of this work that people are doing is starting with very simple, simple stuff. Um, this is a, a this is a simple this is the simplest possible circuit that someone hooked up to the Arduino. This is something you could do in about five minutes. They're using a pencil lead as a as a um, as a resistor, basically. Um, so you, if you knew nothing about electronics. Uh, part of what's nice about sound is you can start with projects that are very, very simple, and um, you can learn about the simplest circuits. Understanding how resistance works is the most fundamental thing that you can learn about electronics. And it happens to work really well for sound circuits, like this example here. Um, at one of the events that we've done in New York, we work with uh, a kit created by a company called Paya. Uh, and they print these things on a business card. That's what that thing is. <laughs> And uh, you don't need a soldering iron. You can punch uh, some cheap parts, about a couple dollars worth in parts, into that card. Um, and you don't have to solder. So you hook this up to a speaker, and it immediately makes noise. And you can do the trick that I need to be able to quickly switch the video, which I can't. But you can do the trick that that, that person did really easily, uh, where you just run a pencil along, and it makes a, a sound kind of like a simple theremin. So this kit is easy enough that we did this event, and uh, 
some people came and did it, and people who were not musicians and not didn't know anything about electronics did it. But one of the people there decided to pick it up, and he's taking this around to kids in schools in the Bronx outside New York. And um, kids, you know, grade school kids, kindergartners, can pick this thing up and, and learn something about electronics, and it's not dangerous, and it's not hard, and they don't have to pick up very hot soldering irons to do it. So things are, are proving to be really accessible. This is the Dradio, which is a, a kit based on the same principle. It's just a, it just builds the whole circuit into a pencil. So you can stick that in water and use the water as the resistance. You can draw big lines and do all kinds of stuff with this. And this has been hugely popular. And I think it's one of the most popular things that they make magazine store sells. Um, so it's... I mean, this this is the simplest way to demonstrate a basic electronics concept. So, this stuff is 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 can be really accessible. At the events that we've done, we try to mix people showing stuff with people making stuff. So this is one of our events. And again, these are not only did they not know anything about electronics, a lot of them weren't musicians. They came in off the street. We handed them a soldering iron. They handed us ten dollars, and they started making things with varying degrees of success. Uh, but with a little help, everybody left with uh, functioning optical theremins. So, uh, and I think the gear helped everybody relax about how they felt as electronics makers. Um, this is a, the same model. Lots of boys and girls showing up in Austin, Texas for a, um, a project with the guys at Leap Labs. Um, building, they have their group in Austin, they'll do a simple project and then a big project and then they take them all together and plug them into amps and do a big jam. Mm -hmm. So stuff is really accessible. Uh, the, other, the other comment about accessibility is that a lot of the projects that people are doing are very, very simple. So this is an off-the-shelf part. Somebody needed it to do something different. This is a Korg um, nano key. And they just ripped a whole bunch of the buttons off added little box, and they were able to turn this into something that, that um, I forget what, oh, they're using it as a foot pedal. So that's why it's, that's why it's arranged. And the funny thing is that this, hopefully Korg isn't listening, this particular product is, a, it's not so reliable. These keys tend to, to snap off. This mod uh, doesn't have that problem because it weighs down the keys with these little blocks that they attach. So the hacked modified version is more reliable than the original of the same product. And it turns it into something that it wasn't designed as. So, it, you know, a lot of these things are time consuming and will certainly keep you from actually making music. Uh, but a lot of the people out there doing these kind of projects uh, really are doing it to solve a problem and save time and save money and make something that's practical and that helps their musical performance. So it, it, it's, there's a big spectrum of what, what people are doing. Um, I think that the, the, the state of the platforms right now. So in the hardware world, one of the things that's driving this is the, a platform called the Arduino. Um, this is a, a synthesizer built on top of it. I think what we'll see um, is this year in particular. I think we're going to see people move beyond just the Arduino platform to more and more microcontroller platforms in general. Um, the brain of the Arduino is something called a, an AVR. It's a little little microprocessor. And um, the funny thing that's happened since the Arduino came out is these things have gotten uh, more accessible than they were when the Arduino came out. So we're seeing not only projects associated with the name Arduino, but people making all kinds of microcontroller-based tools, and more and more sophisticated. Um, a, a friend of mine who's a hardware engineer said that he hopes that this is the year that people stop using our, how did he put this? <laughs> Not stop using Arduinos, but that this becomes the year that people realize Arduino is about more than Arduino. Um, this platform doesn't do a whole lot when you take it home and plug it in, and I think that the next step for this hardware stuff is uh, microprocessor brains that allow you to do more sophisticated sound interaction, work better with wearable technology and all this other stuff. I, I do think that this is about to get a whole lot better. Uh, but still, uh, the Arduino remains a, a really good starting point for a lot of people, and there's a lot of stuff happening. 
And we'll see other boards too. But this is a, a, something called the brain from Livid Instruments. That uh, for anybody in this room has run out of inputs and outputs on the Arduino, stock Arduino, this is 256, I think, or something ridiculous. So um, we'll see a lot more sophisticated kit boards. This came out of a hack day. Somebody put this together in a weekend. A xylophone that's attached to a mono that I think is attached to an Arduino. And I don't remember why I'm showing this, but it shows you all the stuff that's out there. Uh, the other the other platform that's really important is uh, the way that we describe things. Um, we have previously, musicians have used something called MIDI to, to communicate between devices. Um, I do think this could be the year of open sound control, something called OSC. Um, we need better ways, of dis just like this stuff has evolved from music notation, we need better ways of describing events when we connect hardware to one another. Um, this was a couple of years ago. Uh, they were just showing off the amount of hardware that can send OSC messages. And there's everything from a Nintendo Wii remote to different kinds of sensors and electronics. Um, so uh, one of the things that I had always heard from the industry was, well, we can't support OSC, this better human-readable protocol. We have to stick with this old um, limited protocol MIDI because there's no OSC hardware out there. So well, when the hardware comes, then we'll support it. Well, the iPhone now has half a dozen applications that can wirelessly send high-resolution data from someone's phone. Uh, and that's, I think, 30 million, 40, 40 or 50 million units now. So that's 50 million iPhones alone. Um, they're talking here to computer software. Basically, anybody who has a phone or a computer is already ready to... to to use this technology OSC. So people were waiting for things to change. Things are, are changing. And people are using touch interfaces to augment the things that they already have. Mm -hmm. um, so here's one of those iPhones just sitting on a keyboard. It provides easy access to some other stuff that you know in a more practical way. Um, even when you see these on-screen interfaces, a lot of them use uh, things that look like knobs, even though they're not knobs. So I hope that part of what we see is touch interfaces that are more creative. And I'm not going to say anything more about that, because people in this room have already come up with other interesting interfaces. Uh, but the, the other advantage of working this way is um, this is an application called uh, Murmur. And this is a photo from an installation. Imagine you've gotten to walk into this room and see people's projects and see them play them. How many people in here have a smartphone of some kind? Symbian, iPhone, Android, I think is about to. You don't have Androids yet in the Netherlands, right? But I think you're about to get them. Or you do already? I think you're about to. You're either, then you're about to get more. All right, so a lot of this room. Uh, this is a protocol called uh, Murmur, developed by this guy, Eric. Uh, and it allows you to build interfaces like the one he's got on his computer screen and push them out to other mobile devices. So between support for the iPhone, these other smartphones, and then smarter web browsers, uh, you can now walk up and control somebody else's performance or collaborate with somebody um, or you know, bring your computer over and sync up to them and control stuff. Uh, so this will, we're doing a gallery show at the beginning of April that will use this protocol. So this is part of why this underlying technology OSC even if you've never heard of it, is so important. Uh, it's, it's just taking the stuff that the internet already does, that networks already do, and building them into music and visual applications instead of having them run 20 and 30 year old serial protocols. So that people can more easily connect with, with one another and collaborate and, and interact with the stuff that they're doing. Uh, and a, another device that we can thank for this is one called the React Table. This is this cool thing, and Bjork toured around with it, and uh, comes out of this team in Barcelona. But they've made the protocol underneath open. So now this is this crazy multi-touch table that they made. Now there are dozens and dozens of similar tables and hundreds of other applications that are making use of the protocol that they built. So finally, as artists, we've, all had, we've all always had interesting projects. Finally, as artists, we're starting to speak the same I'm not speaking your language, but we're starting to speak the same computer language so that people can, uh, projects can actually work with one another and not just on their own. 
Um, this is the, the vision library that they did that enables those blocks, which is also um, open source. And this is uh, this is somebody, some, we were talking about uh, how important it was that we start to adopt this new protocol, we're not all that new anymore, uh, OSC, and, and speak the same language and, and speak more sophisticatedly between software. So I made some mention to wanting a magical unicorn mascot for OSC, and through the power of the internet, somebody created this the same day. So now OSC has this magical unicorn to bring the joys of OSC to the world. Um, so, and then the other thing that we have is we have better and more mature free software and open source software tools than ever. And um, that, there's a whole bunch of PD in this room, a tool called Pure Data, which is a, a visual development environment for multimedia. And a bunch of the projects in this room run in the software PD. And I think that a lot of people's introduction to open source is through this kind of religious uh, um, proselytizing. You know, convert to open source and you'll be more free as human beings, or culture will survive, or otherwise it will be destroyed. You know, it's some kind of dramatic statement. Uh, and I know that a lot of people don't respond well to that, and a lot of people rely on commercial proprietary software and want to know why other people are so frustrated with them using it. But what, the, uh, what open source and free software tools can do for us is also very practical. It's, so you don't have to be a religious adherent to take advantage of this stuff. This is PD, that same computer environment running on an old iPod. And the guy who does this has a big box of used PDAs that people are going to throw into landfills so they would leak toxic materials into the environment. Instead, he plugs these in and they become, this is capable of, of, of being a little sampler. Uh, so the, the freedom of free software means the ability to run them on any device that you want. And um, I think that could be really powerful. But you don't have to use open source software exclusively. But having better shared free tools means that we can all do projects like this more easily and share them more easily and run them on any hardware we want. Um, this is a, a Linux netbook. This allows a group of students at Virginia Tech to do laptop performance and, and be more expressive with their computers. And Linux combined with PD, combined with other open tools and free schematics for how to make these cool looking speakers, um, allows them to be more successful as an ensemble. And we're also seeing op more openness in proprietary software. This is Max for Live, which is a, allows people to do the things that they're doing with PD um, with some commercial music software, so that they can do that as well. And this also means the ability to run on the smartphones that I mentioned earlier, including my beloved Android. Uh, so Android it brings some of the, those free software capabilities to mobile platforms in a unique sort of way, including this phone that's only in the US, or well, it only has that logo on it in the US. Um, so uh, one of the projects I'm working on that should be ready next month is a controller for the Android phone that other people can build on top of it to, to learn about how to make these devices network with other performers more easily. Um, and the closing thought is, <laughs> all of, I, I was thinking about this as walking around today. I was actually watching the ducks walking on the frozen ponds. And, and you know, one of the great things about evolution is that evolution comes out of adaptation to the environment. And it's the mutations that allow evolution to happen. So like the mallard ducks that are able to hang out in ice cold water that I can't swim in. That somehow started as a mutation. So when I hear other people saying, well, these are all cool, but they're all really weird projects. Or waiting for the you know, perfect instrument that becomes the thing that everybody uses. I think it's actually all the mutations, like the ones in this room, that are so important. All these weird variations, like this robotic percussion ensemble that's part of something called the machine orchestra. Um, it's all of, these, all of these strange mutations. Um, so part of the reason that we do these events and keep them open is to have lots and lots of variations. And, and mutations and get to see what all these different ideas look like and all their diversity instead of the mass-produced kinds of things that we saw at <coughs> those music trade shows. At the same time, have, it's not only about the high technology. I think that the other thing that's going to happen this year and in the coming years is it's, it's time for people with experience with materials 
traditional materials and traditional um, production methods and techniques to combine their skills with some of this digital technology. So this is something that could just be on a screen. These are beautiful uh, wood cuts. They use a, a, a laser cutter to, to etch this stuff into wood. Um, we are, for all of the talk of 3D printers, and 3D printers are great. If you haven't gotten to play with one, they can make crazy forms and print almost the way that you print your inkjet printer. However, uh, every time I see people talking about how 3D printers are going to revolutionize uh, assembly, I think that people have never seen wood. Uh, if you know how to work with wood, you can make almost anything out of wood. So it's time for the people who know how to work with wood and the people who know how to work with software and the people who know how to work with electronics, sometimes who are the same person, but sometimes aren't. You know, it's time for us to get to, to work together. Uh, and the other big frontier is, is textiles and fabric. Um, this is a project that does touch using conductive thread. There's lots of things like this. Um, getting electronics to be soft is one of the biggest remaining frontiers for everybody. It's really easy to make electronics hard and toxic. It's harder to make them work with soft stuff. And soft stuff is important because, you know, we're all kind of soft. I'm softer than some of you. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's really important to be able to, to be able to use all the knowledge and power of textiles in the same way that we can use all this computer software. Uh, cannot load it, really. That's weird. It's in there. Reach off. All right. Well, I, for some reason, I screwed up the JPEG. Uh, but, oh, I wish I bet it's a PNG. Okay. Sorry. It's my fault. Anyway, I'll describe it to you. So, where I have it here. Uh, the, the project that I'm working on next week when I get back um, is with a, a couple of designers who combine electronics experience with textile experience. And as a result, they um, have built a big sewing machine that makes music that looks like this. <laughs> so they've hooked it up to sensors, and that gets hooked up to a computer. And uh, exactly what it sounds like, I think they're developing as we speak, hopefully. So it'll be ready by the time I get back. Uh, but so we're working together and, and, and putting fabric into the performance. And um, they're both really experienced with electronics. And uh, one of these two sisters, uh, Laura Grant, has, uh, has, comes from a, a traditional textiles background. So even though it means applying even more of your brain and knowledge to learning this stuff, uh, the ability to combine some of the traditional knowledge with the new knowledge is, is a, a big, big deal. So that's, the, that's my very compressed state of DIY, the entire landscape. Um, I think Taku was going to ask a couple questions, although most of them want to get on these other projects. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a number of things that I want to touch on, but maybe, well, you were talking about how, how sort of um, difficult it is as an artist to kind of tackle all this stuff, or sometimes it doesn't directly lead to music making sometimes. Um, but what's your, maybe referring to your own work, what, what's your experience of getting your hands dirty with this technology as a composer or a musician? Like, what's the merit you find in it, um, kind of mapping out your, your personal sort of mind up? Well, for my personal, for my personal process, um, and also what I've worked with as a, as a teacher with other people wanting to do this stuff, um, it's use. I, I, well, I've never, I've never regretted learning something. I always find that I know more about sound than I did when I started, and know more <laughs> about the technology that I'm using musically than when I started. Um, so that's always helpful. Also, I think, you know, a, a question that people ask a lot is, well, is the music any better? We have all this new technology. Is, is the music any better than it was? And I. My new answer to that is, does the music have to be better? <laughs> is that even the right question? And, and the reason is, you know, as a composer and a musician, I have all kinds of instincts and, and personal tastes and, and, and personal intuition. Um, but one of the biggest challenges sometimes is getting away from my own personal tastes and intuition and, and instincts. Um, and 
what, what working in this way can do is to force you to construct a system that expresses what you want to create uh, and really get yourself out of just, the, just your habits into really expressing something. That takes a lot of time. So I think the immediate effect is often destructive, you know, because it, 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 it stops you from doing whatever you've learned to do instinctively. Uh, but with time, yeah, I think the music will get better because it means that, you know, as you rebuild your way of making music from the ground up, you can get closer to what it, some of the things that you originally wanted to do than if you just kind of keep repeating old habits. And I have certainly seen from the, the people that I know is that as, as they do this kind of year after year, their music gets better. Now, whether that's better than music in general, I have no idea. But, but for them, they're happier with what they're doing and, and they're able to better express what they're doing. That answers that question. And uh, yeah, totally. Um, I guess my last question would be, you were talking at the beginning about how notation was kind of about the standardization of this uh, musical sort of uh, idea and communicating it. And I think there's still a really strong drive within academia and also in commercial um, areas to look for the standard. And they've been talking about MIDI too again. And, and also in, in uh, academia, people are starting to talk about these sensor instruments saying, well, maybe there's some sort of archetype of these sensor instruments that we could think and develop a pedagogy and a standard. Um, well, and standards are good. Yeah. No, 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 your, your thought is there a way that. to standardize them? Yeah. No, you notation think that, you is good too. Do you think that's a valid, valid direction that this stuff should take when there's so much sort of individualized DIY stuff that's become such a kind of foundation you know, scene? Do you think that's still sort of a direction that this might take or sort of a... Yeah, no, I think there's still a lot of... I mean, without getting really technical, which we don't have time to do, mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of potential to, to standardize the way all of these weird devices talk to each other. Um, especially with this technology, OSC. Um, but the, the challenge of it is, if you, if you just impose a standard and try to tell people what to do, it often doesn't work. And actually, MIDI is a great, again, <coughs> apologies to the gods of MIDI. MIDI is a great example of that. Almost nothing that MIDI, well, how many people here know what MIDI is? Actually, <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so, um, which is, that does, that's not always, you know that's not true of the general population, right? <laughs> uh, so, but it may be true of the Stein mailing list. <laughs> so, uh, if you think through what MIDI does, I mean, MIDI is kind of what people hold up as, this is the way to standardize things. Why don't things like OSC work more like MIDI? Or why don't we just use MIDI forever, for everything? Uh, but the way that, and MIDI is useful for what it does, and it's great that we have the standard that it is, and it, it's awesome, I guess. Uh, the important thing about the important thing about the way that MIDI standardizes things, though, is that it actually broke down. If you look at the um, if you look at the MIDI spec, and you follow through what it tries to standardize, almost every element is a failure. The uh, and it's not the fault of the people who created MIDI. It's the it's us. It's the musicians. It's because we're not all that standard. So, for instance, uh, pitch, which is the one thing that I think MIDI does best. If you play a middle C on a keyboard, there is a somewhat good chance that you'll get what you expect. Um, even pitched it is not entirely, uh, doesn't work entirely. The moment that you transpose another instrument that you're sending MIDI to, that key doesn't represent the same thing anymore. There is nothing in MIDI that says what pitch is which. Uh, MIDI notes go from 0 to 127. Middle C might be 60. It might, that might be one octave below middle C. Uh, someone might have transposed the instrument, so it might be a different note altogether. You might come from a culture that has a different tuning system, in which case MIDI really can't help you. Uh, so it, it, that's already a mess. The rest of MIDI that's supposed to work so well, things like um, control changes. If you look at the spec for control changes and what's listed there, people follow almost none of it. A lot of the categories don't make any sense. They're things like modulation, it's not clear what modulation means. Uh, you can go down the list, then there are a whole bunch of things that say undefined or general purpose, which is different from undefined. Because it's defined that it's undefined. You know, it, it, it's it's a it's a big mess. So, but maybe that's not the fault of MIDI. Maybe that's the fault of even with the selection of things that MIDI 
maps to, which are pretty standard, there's a lot of variation. Maybe what you need is not a, way, a, a strict standard, but a standardized way of referring to things that are not standardized. That's why OSC can work. Because um, instead of trying to invent new ways of doing everything, the new direction of OSC is, let's look at the internet. You know, and we have tons of stuff happening on the internet that is standardized, but that also covers a wide range of things. So we just need messages that can describe themselves and say, hi, I'm a new message that, look around the room, I'm a new uh, uh, robotic head control message, right? It could be head orientation for all helmet-based interfaces. And one person's helmet-based interface might do three axes of rotation. The other might also know where it is on Earth and do GPS. We just need ways of saying to a foreign piece of software, here is a message that, that does this, and here is its range, uh, and then allow the other software to deal with that flexibly. And that's the thing that's worked best in MIDI with things like MIDI Learn. So it's, it can work even better with a new protocol. So that's the answer to that question. The answer is yes, we can standardize it. <laughs> um, I'm sure you guys have some questions, but I want to get to the projects, actually. Um, Pete is around all night, so you can um, drill him afterwards. Um, why don't we go counterclockwise, starting from Dave. Um, yeah, let's kind of keep it relatively short. But, um, so if you guys could kind of... Yeah. synthesized, but it's all digital. And I bought a little keyboard with it, and I thought, what the hell was I thinking? I, I, I cannot play keys, and I hate keys, and I want to play joysticks. So um, um, uh, I made a little, um, I made a little joystick, and um, uh, I play harmonica quite well, and uh, I uh, place the keys uh, in the joystick. Uh, as, as if they are uh, like they are ordered in a, in a, uh, in a harmonica, so uh, that works. And I like um, I like Indian music, and they tend to have a drone, and they tend to have these tabla beats. And um, at one point, I was trying to uh, control my analog synthesizer with uh, with my um, tabla boy here, and um, um, this didn't really work. But I built this. 32-step uh, analog sequencer, which does most of the things that the Moog uh, uh, analog sequencer does. Um, the first thing I did is that I made it um, convert back into my... Uh, uh, so, it should be able to play... Oh, <laughs> 
video and audio. I'm not so uh, expert about audio, but uh, in the music. But um, yeah, I got some. Sometimes you uh, <laughs> some some uh, years of conservatory. So now I'm trying to get back with electronics and uh, do something with music, but also with video, that is my passion. So this is an interactive system for painting. Some of you already uh, saw it before, and um, it needs just a few seconds, uh, 15 seconds for the connection. This is an interactive palette uh, made uh, uh, with a Wii, so hacking uh, a Wii remote controller. And um, simply um, uh, putting some uh, switches, uh, electronic switches on it. So from uh, this palette, you can uh, choose colors uh, with this uh, pencil. That is an interactive pencil that I love to call it uh, Psy Pencil. This is Psy Palette. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I connect um, the eye that is actually the engine of the system because it reads the movements of the pencil and so allow to play music and paint uh, at the same time. A few seconds for so this part. Sorry, I was keeping energy for the batteries because um, this uh, system actually needs uh, batteries to work. And so here we are. And uh, I should give you my shoulders. I'm sorry, otherwise someone of you can uh, come over here and try, but uh, it needs just a little bit of training to know what is for what. So here you can uh, uh, clear the screen, and uh, here you can select colors, and then start to paint. Battery finished. And um, choosing different colors, the, the base will change the base of the music. And I'm trying to work, uh, it's a prototype actually, this one. So I'm trying to uh, make a, a, a real sound here. Uh, this is a kind of uh, rhythm, but still not uh, music. It's a kind of uh, sound effect. And uh, the challenge is to create something more nice. So, okay, if you move the, the palette, you can uh, change the dimension of what you are painting. And here, you, with this uh, button, you choose a style of painting and different kind of music. Going on. Uh, music, sorry, <laughs> sound effects. And uh, you can paint in front of the eye different kind of colors. Uh, instruments around uh, this cool uh, music instrument and the challenge of electronics and uh, the 
hacking materials to create sound is uh, actually the one to create music and uh, start to produce in, in a way beauty, uh, visual beauty and also uh, sound beauty. I'm working on a project that is uh, interactive art therapy, so I call it interactive art therapy. So I'm trying to bring some uh, goodness around people with uh, kind of toys and uh, uh, amusement stuff that people can use uh, quite soon. That's great. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm a DJ turntablist, and basically for my performance, I wanted to sample the sound from the record as fast as I can. And I was using foot pedals and switches, but that wasn't fast enough, and I thought, well, what's the fastest uh, body part that I have? It's my fingers. Um, so I, I built this module in Max, and I built some hardware uh, after I came to Stein, and um, I sort of developed into a whole performance setup. And so I'm just showing you the basic module, and um, I'll keep it short, it's kind of for you guys to also try it out because my inspiration to kind of continue on with this was that it was kind of fun to play with. And it was sort of this really direct way of sampling. So you got the turntable now. <laughs> because it's just a very uh, small thing to show. I, I really like uh, toys. So, no, I do. So I, I, um, I like what my main musical instrument. I use these, these uh, toy game controllers to control music play and, and perform music. And um, so that is a lot of fun. I, I think the traditional programs like, like you know, the big doors, they're really very boring. They seem to take themselves enormously serious. And so um, what I did here, and I, I, I suppose people will have to stop by later, so you can see the small uh, screen maybe from the back, and we were out of beamers. So what I did here is have sort of a toy world uh, that, instead of controlling sound, gets controlled by the sound for people to play around with them. Uh, I ran it as a sort of public installation uh, where people could make noises with these big boxes that I, I had done and to you know, just enjoy themselves that way. And that worked very well. So in this case, I set it up for, you know, for Rob to play with, with his sound. And so. Right. Um, but we will see that moving on later because it responds on the sounds. Uh, what I brought is basically a setup I use for uh, live gigs and some uh, radio shows I do. Um, the, the basic is the basis is the laptop with the pure data program I wrote, which has like a, a four four times tape loop system. And the goal I have for this thing is to be able to make a new song of five minutes in five minutes <laughs> and without having to do any uh, preparation or like spending uh, weeks to pitch the hi hat or something. Um, I have a couple of sound sources. One is this old uh, groove box I use for the uh, samples. It's quite hard to load samples while you're playing with uh, pure data and uh, turntable. And then uh, some samples I have on the computer. Uh, this is a little digital turntable I built from an old optical mouse, which I can use in a couple different ways. One way I can use it to uh, manipulate the sound. <laughs> Manipulate the sample, and later on I can also uh, the loops I've recorded 
uh, play them di directly with the turn table. Uh, for, for the, I can also play the samples with, with the mini controller. So like, and I can change the, the sample as like a basic uh, start and end, and I can change also the, the start point and end point of that thing live. So if I have like this, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the sample, <laughs> and I can also take like a tiny piece and do that. <laughs> So these are the basic, basic uh, sound sources I use. Um, so I will sh show you uh, fastly how this looping thing uh, sort of works. So. send some time coding depending on the length of the recording I made to clock that to uh, a live a drum so um, let's see so now actually the the, the time steps are uh, they are locked according to the sample I just made Next to the sample, I can make another uh, loop. And some funny thing I discovered while uh, making this was that I could change the timing of these loops and let them record again in itself. So if I and I change the timing, I can make it very short. And then Thing I record, I can manipulate also directly now with this. Thing. 